Jesus is risen. Indeed, he is risen. He is risen from the dead. We celebrate this and we keep drawing close to it because if this is true, this message that we proclaim, that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then it changes everything. Everything hinges on this. As St. Paul would say, that, that because he's been raised, our, whole, our lives make sense. But if not, then we're the most pitiable of fools and we should find something better to do with our Sunday mornings. But if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then everything has been changed. And that's why we have 50 days throughout the Easter season to ponder this mystery, draw deep into the reality of what we celebrate today, divine mercy. We have the image of divine mercy there um, on, on, the, on the screens. We have our beautiful image of divine mercy in front of one of our confessionals. And this affects us at the most fundamental levels because I want to do a little, uh, little public confession for you guys. I want to tell you guys a little part of myself. And, and we're cool, right? You guys won't tell this to other people, right? All right, so just between us, just between us, us friends. So... Uh, you're like, oh, what's it going to be? It's not that juicy. I'm sorry. As a kid growing up, up until probably, I don't know, way too late, I was terrified of the dark. So scared of the dark. Just, just so scared. And it didn't help that I had older brothers that would tell me things about what would happen if any body part was left out from underneath the blankets? It'd be removed by some sort of monster or whatever it is. I won't name any names of monsters or brothers that might have said that to me. And I remember growing up with that and like the night would just go on forever because it was just a constant, it was just a one wave of anxiety and stress and fear after another. And I was sharing a room with my older brother, Sean, at the time, who was in high school, and I was like, wouldn't it be funny or cool if we had a nightlight in the room? And he was like, absolutely not. We're not going to do that. I'm like, yeah, I didn't want to. That's lame. But I really did want to. I really, really did. I just wanted some glimmer of light and that seemingly unending darkness. Those nights that seem to never end. I wanted something, because as, as long as you can see a little bit of light, and there's a little bit of hope. And I think that's, that's a great place for us to start, to allow ourselves to be amazed and moved by the power of what we celebrate as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his victory over sin and death. And because he has been raised, that he invites us into that victory as well. Because it always starts in the dark. If you were with us last week, we celebrated the Easter Vigil Mass. Several, several of our brothers and sisters were baptized. Uh, several confirmed, received First Holy Eucharist. Others were brought into full communion with the church. Um, it, was, it was an amazing evening, but it starts in absolute darkness. That's one of the, the, the prescriptive lines that the church gives us. It has to be, it can't be, you know, as the sun's going down. It has to be in complete and total darkness. And we entered into this church, this darkened church, and there was only one light, and it was this. It was the Paschal candle, which represents for us is the light of Jesus. The light of Jesus that goes into the darkest place, the place of death, the abode of the dead, hell itself. That Jesus marches into that place as the light. And it's from that place that he saves us. So I want you to think about those moments in your life, or maybe that time, or maybe it's right now, when you were in darkness. That place that felt like it would go on forever. That place where you felt so helpless and scared and terrified. That place of darkness, that place even of death. Because it's into that place that the Lord wants to go. We see this and we think about this with, uh, today we hear from, the, uh, from St. John as he begins the book of Revelation, and he talks about that the Lord came to him as he's worshiping at the liturgy at Mass. Revelation is the unveiling. Apocalypse means to unveil, to pull back the veil of the bride. Revelation is not some sort of Nostradamus prediction about what's going to happen with world politics in the future. 
That's the least important part of what it's talked about. It's the unveiling of what is happening in heaven and what is happening every time we enter in to heaven on earth, which is the mass, the liturgy. We get a peek behind the curtain. We're drawn into this mystery of God being wed to his people, the wedding feast of the Lamb with his bride, the church. But it begins all these amazing signs and, and, and apocalyptic images and troubling portents and armies and bloodshed and violence and predictions and proclamations, symbols that are used throughout the whole book of Revelation. And we encounter all those symbols every single time we come to Mass. It begins in darkness. John is in exile. He's been exiled for away from family, away from friends, away from his support. He's been exiled to this penal colony called Patmos by the Roman Empire. Tradition says that they tried to execute John, the beloved disciple, several times, like they had executed the other apostles. But none, all the executions failed. So finally they decided, well, we'll just put him where he can't do any harm. Little did they know that in that place of darkness, Jesus Christ, the risen one, would meet his beloved disciple. Just in that same way, at the beginning of the 20th century, in the midst of all the darkness that was unfolding across Europe and across the world, Jesus came, drew near to a a religious sister named Faustina, Sister Faustina. And he came to her and drew close to her and, said, and came to her and, as a revelation, as a reminder, as a proclamation of the most important attribute of, attribute of God that was most needed during the bloodshed that was about to un, un, ensue throughout that century. The darkness that would cover the whole world. And Jesus said, what this world needs is my mercy to be reminded of my mercy. And so the image of divine mercy, we have a, 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 up on the screen the original image of divine mercy. Jesus is in total darkness, and the light that emanates, emanates from his heart. The rays of blood and water become that mercy and that grace that flow out from Jesus, who meets us in darkness. Jesus who goes down amongst the dead to speak a word of life to us. Because Jesus Christ did not enter into this world, teach, suffer, die, be raised from the dead, ascend to the Father, and give us the Holy Spirit just to give us some behavior modification. He did all those things to bring dead men and women back to life. And so he meets us in our darkness. And he comes as the light of the world. And so that no part of your life, if you are in Christ, no moment of your existence belongs to the devil. So often, far too often we do that. We, we maybe have a conversion later on in life where we think about, oh man, me in my 20s or me last week or whatever. That, that was a dark time in my life. That was, that was a, I'm, I'm ashamed of that time. I'm ashamed of that moment. I'm ashamed of that relationship. But to open that place up to recognize that no part of you belongs to the devil, not even your sin. If you are in Christ, even your sin becomes a place where Jesus Christ now reigns. If, you've submi if you submit that to the Lord, we have reconciliation going on right now, sacrament of confession, if you place that under his mercy, then now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As the scriptures would say that even the darkness is not dark for you, Lord. The second thing that we see, Jesus entering into the darkness, second thing that we see throughout these readings, this beautiful passage from John's gospel, is the wounds of Jesus. Jesus is known to his disciples by his wounds. Jesus shows them the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. It's such a mystery that even in his resurrected body, Jesus keeps his wounds. He keeps his wounds. He still has his wounds. 
the glorified humanity of Jesus Christ that has been raised and ascended to the right hand of the Father, the beating heart of Jesus that reigns at the right hand of his Father in heaven is still wounded. And those wounds are never going to close. They're never going to heal. But far too often, we think, we believe a lie that in order to get close to Jesus, I need to cover over my wounds. I need to cover over my brokenness. I need to pretend. I need to fake it till I make it. I need to pretend because everyone else here has it all together. All these other people, they got it all together. That family over there and that person over there and that couple, look how loving they are. I wish my, I was that loving with my spouse. Like, oh, this, this, this lie that we believe concocted in Satan's laboratory when the truth is that the only way to get close to Jesus is by opening up your wounds, by showing them to Jesus, by allowing him to love you there. And the only access that we have to the Father is through the wounds of Jesus. There's no other way. Your perfection, your self-sufficiency, your pride, all those lead to hell. Only the wounded can enter into the banquet that God has prepared. And we do it through his wounds. So to think about those wounded places in your own heart where you have been wounded, where you have wounded others, those places maybe that have been covered over with shame, that's open those up to the Lord, to give him permission to love you there. Because when you know that you're loved there, then even those wounds become glorious. Just as the wounds of Jesus are now glorious and become a source of hope, a source of light in the midst of this dark world. So that, that draws us into this attribute of God, what God wanted for the, the world at the beginning, uh, at 2,000 years ago, at the beginning of creation, at the beginning of the 20th century, and now in the 21st century. We look upon the darkness of this world, we look upon war and bloodshed and vitriol and division and hatred, injustice. We think about the wounds that have been inflicted the people that have been hurt, lives that have been destroyed. And God's response is mercy. And what he wants for us is to be so defined by mercy that we in turn become mercy for others. We become mercy for others. Because what is mercy? Mercy is where love looks upon poverty. And if you're not in touch with your poverty, your lack, your emptiness, then you can't receive the mercy of God. But if you recognize, Lord, I don't have what I need. I don't have the love. I don't have the grace. I don't have the peace. I'm empty. That's exactly where he wants to meet, to meet us, with his mercy. So that when you encounter the emptiness, the brokenness, the stupidity of other people, Instead of being moved by vitriol and judgment and condemnation, the world has enough of that, it doesn't need any more, we can be moved by what moves the heart of God, which is mercy. To look up upon people's poverty with love and tenderness. So that's the invitation for us today. Thinking about our own darkness, thinking about our own wounds, to recognize that's exactly where God wants to meet us. That's exactly where God wants to set us free, to give us new life, to resurrect us. So as we receive the love and the mercy of God in our darkness, in our wounds, then we're sent out as those Easter people who recognize and rejoice that God has triumphed over sin and death. Jesus Christ is alive. We can bring that mercy to others. So that today, in the coming week, when you encounter somebody's brokenness, when you encounter the darkness of this world, when you encounter someone else's wounds, you can respond not with judgment, not with hatred or condemnation or vitriol, but you can respond with what we in turn receive today as Jesus speaks his peace to us, as Jesus opens up his wounds to us, we can respond with the mercy of Jesus himself.